In this video lesson, we'll discuss the advantages and disadvantages on both sides as the Civil War begins. When war broke out, the South seemed to have great advantages to the North. The Confederacy could fight defensively behind interior lines, they, which means they were going to fight a defensive war and wait for the North to come to them. The North had to invade the vast territory of the Confederacy and conquer it and then drag it back to the Union. The South actually did not have to win the war in order to win its independence. Fighting on their own soil for self-determination and preservation of their way of life, Southerners at first enjoyed an advantage in morale as well over the North. Militarily, South, from the opening volleys of the war, had the most talented officers. Most conspicuous among a dozen commanders was General Robert E. Lee, whose knightly bearing and chivalric sense of honor embodied the Southern ideal. Uh, Lee had actually been asked by Abraham Lincoln to lead the Union forces, but Robert E. Lee was from Virginia, and since Virginia seceded from the Union, he felt that he needed to stay with his home state. Lincoln had unofficially offered the command um, to Lee for the Northern armies, but again, Lee was honor-bound to stay with Virginia. His chief lieutenant for much of the war was Thomas Stonewall Jackson, who was a gifted theorist and a master of speed and deception. Besides leaders, ordinary Southerners were also bred to fight, accustomed to managing horses and bearing arms from boyhood. They made excellent cavalrymen and foot soldiers. High-pitched rebel yells were designed to strike terror in the hearts of the Yankee recruits. As one immense farm, the South seemed to be handicapped by the scarcity of factories, yet by seizing federal weapons, running Union blockades, and developing their own ironworks, Southerners managed to, uh, to obtain enough weaponry to fight the war. As the war dragged on, grave shortages of shoes, uniforms, and blankets are going to disable the South. Even with immense stores of food on southern farms, civilians and soldiers often went hungry because of supply problems. Much of the hunger was caused by a breakdown of the South's rickety and smaller transportation system. The economy was the greatest southern weakness, but it was the greatest northern strength. The north was not only a huge farm, but a sprawling factory as well. Yankees boasted about three-fourths of the nation's wealth, including three-fourths of the railroad miles. The North controlled the sea with its vastly superior navy and established a blockade to be able to choke off southern supplies and shatter southern morale. Its sea power also enabled the North to exchange huge quantities of grain for munitions and supplies from Europe. Successful revolutions have generally succeeded because of foreign intervention, and the South had counted on foreign intervention in the Civil War as well, but they are not going to get help from foreigners at all. Of the Confederacy's potential, Confederacy's potential assets, none counted more heavily than the prospect of foreign intervention. Europe's ruling classes were sympathetic to the Confederate cause, um, but they are not going to become involved in the Civil War on the Confederate or on the Northern side. In contrast, the, mass, the masses of working people in Britain, to some extent in France, were pulling and praying for the North. Many had read Uncle Tom's Cabin and sensed that the war might extinguish slavery if the North emerged victorious. Their certain hostility to any official intervention on behalf of the South evidently had a very sobering effect on the British government, and Uncle Tom helped Uncle Sam by restraining the British and French ironclads from piercing the Union blockade. Why did King Cotton fail when British textile mills depended on the American South for 75% of their cotton supplies? It failed, in part, because it had been so lavishly productive in the immediate pre-war years that enormous exports of cotton had piled up surpluses in British warehouses and British manufacturers. So they actually had an oversupply of cotton, and they didn't really need any. The real pinch did not come until about a year and a half later when work was lost. By that time, Lincoln had announced his slave emancipation policy, and the wage slaves of Britain were not going to demand a war to defend the slave owners. The Union enjoyed a much larger reserve of manpower. The loyal states had a population of 22 million, 
while the Confederacy and the seceding states had only 9 million of them, including about 3.5 million slaves. Adding to the North's overwhelming supply of soldiers were the ever more immigrants coming from Europe, who continued to pour into the North during the war. Over 800,000 newcomers arrived between 1861 and 1865, most of them British, Irish, and German. Large numbers of them were induced to enlist into the Union Army. Whether immigrant or native, ordinary northern boys were much less prepared than their southern counterparts for military life, which were in the south, they were very much known for their discipline and determination. The north was much less fortunate in its higher commanders. Lincoln was forced to use a costly trial and error method to sort out effective leaders from many incompetent political officers until he finally uncovers General Ulysses S. Grant, which will lead them to victory. In the long run, as the northern strengths were brought to bear, they outweighed those of the south, but when the war began, the chances for southern independence were actually unusually favorable. A turn of a few events could have easily produced a different outcome. If the border states had seceded, if uncertain states of the upper Mississippi Valley had turned against the Union, if a wave of northern defeatism had demanded an armistice, or if Britain or France had gotten involved and broken the blockade, the South might well have won the war. The direct effects of the cotton famine in Britain were relieved in several ways. Hunger among unemployed workers was partially eased when southern kind-hearted Americans sent over several cargoes of foodstuffs. Union armies captured or bought considerable supplies of cotton and shipped them to Britain and Confederates ran a bit by blockade. In addition, the cotton growers of Europe and India, responding to the high prices, increased their output, finally booming war industries in England, which supplied both North and South, relieved unemployment that was throughout Britain. King Wheat and King Corn, both monarchs of Northern agriculture, proved to be more potent than King Cotton. And during these war years, the North was blessed with ideal weather to produce bountiful crops of grain and harvest them with the mechanical reaper. At the same time, the British suffered a series of bad harvests and were forced to import huge quantities of grain from America, more specifically from the North, which happened to have the cheapest and most abundant supply. If Britain had broken the blockade to gain cotton, they would have provoked the North to war and would have been unable to uh, buy any of the grain from the North. America's diplomatic front had seldom been so critical as during the Civil War. The South never wholly abandoned its dream of foreign intervention um, from Europe. The first major crisis with Britain came over the Trent Affair late in 1861. The Union warship was cruising on the high seas north of Cuba and stopped a British mail steamer called the Trent and forcibly removed two Confederate diplomats that were in fact bound for Europe. The Britons were outraged. Upstart Yankees could not so boldly offend the mistress of the seas. War preparations buzzed and red-coated troops embarked for Canada. The London Foreign Office prepared an ultimatum demanding surrender of the prisoners and an apology. But luckily, very slow communications gave passions on both sides a chance to cool. Lincoln came to see the Trent prisoners as white elephants and reluctantly released them, knowing that he could only fight one war at a time, and he was not wanting to involve the British and fight on a Canadian front as well as fighting the Confederacy to the south. Another major crisis in the Anglo-American relations arose over the unneutral building in Britain of Confederate commerce raiders, one notably called the Alabama. They were not warships in British law because they left their shipyards unarmed and picked up armed elsewhere. But the Alabama escaped in 1862 to the Portuguese Azores and took weapons and a crew from two British ships that followed. Although flying the Confederate flag and officered by Confederates, it was manned by Britons and never encountered a Confederate port. Britain was thus the chief naval base of the Confederacy. The Alabama lighted the skies from Europe to the Far East with the burning hulks of Yankee merchantmen. All told, this British pirate vessel captured over 60 vessels. Competing British shippers were delighted, and an angered North had to divert naval strength from its blockade in order to fight and prevent um, this steamship from continuing to interfere.
The Alabama was beneath the waves, but the issue of the British-built Confederate raiders stayed afloat. American minister Charles Francis Adams persuaded the British that allowing such ships to be built was a dangerous precedent that might be used against them. In 1863, London openly violated its own leaky laws and seized another raider being built for the South. Though efforts were made to stay neutral, the destroyers captured more than 250 Yankee ships, severely crippling the American merchant marine, and they were never recovered. A final Anglo-American crisis was touched off when two Confederate warships were being constructed in the shipyard of John Laird and Sons in Great Britain. Designed to destroy the wooden ships of the Union Navy with their iron rams and large caliber guns, they were far more dangerous than the swift but lightly armed Alabama. In retaliation, the North doubtless would have invaded Canada, and a full-dress war with Britain would have erupted, but American minister took the hard line, warning that if this is war, that the rams were released from Great Britain. At the last minute, the London government relented and bought the two ships for the Royal Navy. Everyone seemed satisfied except for the disappointed Confederate Army. Britain also repented its sorry role to the Alabama business. It agreed in 1871 to submit the Alabama dispute to arbitration and in 1872 paid $15.5 million to the United States in reparations. American resentment was also directed at Canada, despite the vigilance of the British authorities. Southern agents continued to plot to burn northern cities. Hatred of England burned especially fiercely among the Irish Americans, and they unleashed their fury on Canada. They raised several tiny armies and launched invasions of Canada, notably in 1866 and 1870. The Canadians condemned the Washington government for permitting violations of neutrality, but administration was hampered by the presence of Irish American voters. Two great nations emerged from the fiery furnace of the American Civil War. One was a reunited United States, and the other was a united Canada. The British Parliament established the Dominion of Canada in 1867. It was partially designed to bolster the Canadians, both politically and spiritually, against the possible vengeance of the U.S. Emperor Napoleon III of France, taking advantage of America's preoccupation with its own internal problems, dispatched a French army to occupy Mexico City in 1863. In 1864, he installed on the ruins of his crushed republic his puppet, Austrian Archduke Maximilian, as Emperor of Mexico, which was a direct violation of the Monroe Doctrine. Napoleon had sent an army and enthroned Maximilian. He was gambling that the Union would collapse and that the Americans would be too weak to enforce its hands-off policy of the Monroe Doctrine. When the shooting stopped in 1865, Secretary of State Seward prepared to march south, and Napoleon realized that his gamble was doomed. Napoleon took French leave in 1867, and Maximilian soon crumpled before a Mexican firing squad. We'll continue to look at the foreign entanglements that were prevented and both involved in during the Civil War and how they affected the outcome in class. <laughs>